Okay, so uh, good morning. Welcome again to Kabbalah Decoded Sunday class. Uh, I had a few questions uh, via email. Um, one of them is actually a three-part question. So I'm going to address two of them now, and then one of them maybe later on we'll see. <clears throat> uh, the quest, One of the questions was, can I comment on the prayer, Anabakoach? Um, and also on Patach Eliyahu. I'll explain what these are in a minute. In terms of the help in humility, opening spiritual wisdom, and facing your tikkun. Uh, I won't generally say the names of the people who ask the questions, because I... I'm not sure that they want me to ask, uh, mention the names. If you do want me to mention, say I can mention your name, so I will. In any event, <clears throat> okay, so what is the prayer on The prayer on is actually a Kabbalistic prayer in and of itself. And I know that there's some groups that use it exclusive, almost exclusively and very extensively. Um, the prayer on is actually the way it is set out. Um, all the words of that prayer, the initial letters of, of each of the words of the prayer, forms a very uh, powerful and very holy divine name, which is called Shem Membet, the 42-letter name. It forms a 42-letter name. However, be aware that um, using it when one is not in a sufficient state of purity and, um, and holiness, um, A, it won't work, and B, I don't want to say it could be harmful to you, but um, it certainly won't be of uh, benefit to a person if he, is, he or she is not on the level of spirituality where uttering this prayer, not in the context of prayer, is, um, if it's used in that way, if it's in the context of prayer, it's a different thing, but um, just using it anytime, anywhere, is not really that advisable. Does it open up spiritual wisdom if one understands what it's all about and one uses it? It is true that there are some methods and methods in Kabbalah um, which you don't need to understand in order for them to work. There are many, in fact, there are many methods in Kabbalah which you don't need to understand, and probably uh, let's go further and say that um, most people will not understand and yet nevertheless work. However, in many cases, that's like taking... Um, how shall I say it? It's like, uh, you know, taking a hammer and chisel... Uh, to somewhere where you need a very fine pen. Um, in other words, it's far too far too powerful and far too rough for the um, uh, purposes which we need, uh, which which are needed. So it's always better to tailor one's uh, requirements to, uh, rather, tailor, tailor the means to one's requirements, which, in truth, is. For this one generally needs uh, the advice or direction of a Kabbalistic sage. Uh, although it's not exclusively the case, if a person has enough uh, learning behind them, they can use the uh, Kabbalistic methods. Uh, if they use it knowingly and understandingly and uh, have enough background, they can use it on their own. Now, in terms of Patach Eliyahu, <coughs> uh, Patach Eliyahu is... Um, the introduction to the Tikkunai Zohar, it is uh, one of the introductions, actually a couple of introductions to the um, uh, Tikkunai Zohar. The Tikkunai Zohar is a work which was is part of the Zohar literature. It was written, uh, according to Jewish and Kabbalistic tradition, was written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and it really has 70 Tikkunim. 70 uh, rectifications, which are all based on the first word of the Bible. The first word of the Bible is Breshit. Um, Breshit in the beginning. And it is 70 interpretations of the word Breshit by discovering their various permutations. For example, one of the permutations is Beit, the word Breshit, 
is Bet Reshit, two beginnings. Two beginnings meaning two motivating sources for creation. Um, and then he goes on to explain what those are. Those, those, that's just an example. Uh, another, another example is that the word Breshit can be divided into the word and Brit Eish, a covenant of fire. Another example, uh, Bara Shis. He created the six sides, six sides of space, which is six sides of, uh, of the Partsuf of Zer Anpin. The cluster of Svirot, known as Zer Anpin, uh, comprises six sides or six Svirot. Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Netzachod, Yesod. And that is Barashit. He created those three things, Barashit. He created those three, those six things rather, uh, as the sides of, uh, of uh, spiritual space corresponding to physical space, which is four directions north, south, west, east, up, and down, six directions. So, <clears throat> in terms of the letter of Nachmanides, let's leave that a little bit later. Uh, that, in fact, is very useful to read on a daily basis, and there are many people that do read it on a daily basis, to help with humility, opening spiritual wisdom, and so on and so forth. And there are no restrictions on that particular, uh, that particular thing. There are no restrictions of where it should be said, and, 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 uh, but it is something that one can understand fairly simply and straightforward if if uh, one has a good translation. Of course, one can read it in the original, but with a good translation, there's no reason that you can't um, uh, understand it. I believe the Art Scroll translation is a good one. And there may be others. But um, that's that uh, particular question. Okay. Uh, let us go to another question. I'm just addressing the questions that came in by email first. Uh, he has a practical question. Um, meat that's in the frozen meat section prior to switching over for Pesach, for Passover, doesn't mean the meat has changed uh, versus the meat that is placed in the same section freeze, uh, freezer after the switching over, but now labeled kosher for Pesach. Uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't. Oops, sorry, I mentioned your name. It doesn't, um, it doesn't mean necessarily that there's any difference in the meat. It's just that, um, as you probably know, in various in stores, um, when people are handling um, non-kosher uh, or, or uh, items that are not kosher for Passover, um, you know, they may first go and get some rolls and and, and do it with their hands or uh, some other kind of uh, whatever, and then you know, go and touch the. Um, so it doesn't change the meat, but maybe the wrapping or whatever it is. It's just that they like to keep things separate. Uh, there's no absolute obligation in your own freezer. It wouldn't make a difference, but just in a public place where people are not careful. That's the only real reason for it. Um, okay, here we are. Here are some more questions. Okay. Uh, someone asked a question. <laughs> Um, something that's been troubling this person. How do you know when it's time to leave your study group, when another comes along with some other indication, when you're not getting anything out of it? Um, there's no, um, you know, there's no obligation to stay. Uh, if you feel that you're not benefiting and you're not growing, um, so then it's time to leave. Of course, if you feel that there's subjects that you would like to address are not being addressed, or you feel that there are things that you would like addressed more deeply or more with more explanation, uh, just shoot me an email and we can do that. But on the other hand, um, you know, it's your, it's your choice. There's no, uh, no obligation to stay in the group. And um, that's the deal. Okay, so... Um, Oh, so now I'm getting another message um, <laughs> from the same person that the person didn't mean that, it didn't mean this group, but a different group. Um, um, yeah, you know, I, I see that your message is a private, so I'm not going not to answer the last part of the message, which is kind of private to you. Um, you have to assess... Um, you know, if that group is offering you anything or not. I think I did the same I would have said about myself. Okay. Uh, let's have some other questions.
Any other questions? Well, everyone seems to have everything straight and everything understood. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, I was told with reference to Rishonim and even mentioning Ramban is an opinion that Abraham failed the Akeda test and it was not supposed to be the last test. Um, yes, there is an opinion. There is, there is such an opinion that, um, that there's an opinion that he did not, um, he didn't really do well in that test. He, um, there, there is such an opinion, but it's a very, it's a very strange opinion to understand, and it's very, it's very, very hard to uh, to figure out what uh, what they really meant by that. Let me just explain uh, the background to the question. If everybody remembers the story of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, uh, Abraham was told to go and bind his son Isaac and um, and offer him up on one of the mountains which he would be shown anywhere they go and he binds his son and uh, he's about to um uh he's about to actually go through with the uh with the slaughter and the voice of an angel comes and uh, and uh, comes to him and says don't don't do it it was just a test and uh to see if you were you know you're faithful and you listen to the word of god and so on and so forth and um and he doesn't he doesn't actually um, slaughter him. Now, it um, the the whole story in, in in and of itself is a very puzzling story. One of the interpretations is that God never actually said to slaughter Isaac. He never said that. He said, Sham, raise him up to a level which is um, beyond the level of life in this world. Never said to actually slaughter him. So God's word was not, um, because you can ask the question, since God told him to offer up his son, the word la ola is, a, uh, is, a, is, a, is an offering uh, which is completely consumed by the, um, it's the it's sacrifice and then um, burnt in fire completely. No one has any part in it completely offered up. So when God tells him, uh, take him up there as an Ola offering, that could be understood in the literal sense, which means that uh, you have to be slaughtered and then put up on the uh, on the altar. Um, now, the interpretation is that that wasn't, even though that, that was what, what Abraham was meant to understand, and that was the test. Nevertheless, God does not uh, undo his word, tell him to do one thing and then do the opposite. No, it, it was worded in such a way that Abraham was, of course, led to understand that that's what was needed. But at the last moment, the real interpretation was revealed to him by the angel and so on and so forth. And therefore, he offered him up to heaven as a person who was entirely holy. He became entirely holy to the extent that, it's an interesting thing, if you see the age of Isaac um, at the time that he, that he passed away, and yet you, you check the ages right throughout the, um, uh, the various accounts, you see that there's two years missing. There are two years missing. He should have been um, older than he was. Should have been two years older. If you if you add up all the um, all the incidents and figure out the timeline, should have been two years older. So the Zohar explains that those two years were spent in the Garden of Eden. They were spent in a, a higher plane of existence where the time that he spent there is not counted in this world. And that was the raising him up to a higher world, and eventually when he came back into this world, he remained a, um, entirely holy, which is why, uh, another explanation of why he, was, he went blind when he was older, when he was elderly, why he went blind. One of the explanations is, not that he was blind, he just didn't see this world as we see the world. He saw only the inner dimension of the world, not the outer dimension. 
in any event, I hope uh, that more or less answers the question. Now, uh, there are some commentaries that say Abraham failed the test in the sense that God told him one thing and the angel told him a different thing. Um, and um, why did he listen to the angel instead of to God? So Rashi already addresses that and he says that um, when it comes to matters of taking life, that can only be via command from God. But when it comes to saving a life, you don't need God to tell you to do that. An angel is enough. In fact, even less than an angel. All right. Uh, next. I hope that answers that question. Next question. Would it be okay to describe the Hechalot, the seven chambers of the light is referring to? Um, in fact... The Hechalot is not just seven chambers. Uh, there are um, hundreds of chambers, in fact. It's just seven chambers on one level that's, uh, that's been spoken about. Usually it's just the seven chambers of Yitzira. There is a whole literature, in fact, um, a, quite a thick book, called, well, it's called the Hechalot literature, the Hechalot section of Kabbalah. Um, it's mostly based on the uh, writings of a sage named Rabbi Ishmael, and the um, he was actually a he was he was a, uh, at one time the high priest of Bishmuel Coin Godel, and um, he describes his journeys through the various chambers. Hechalot means chambers, really. He describes his journey through the chambers and how he got through all of the chambers. Each chamber has a guard. Now, when we say chamber, we mean uh, spiritual level, spiritual um, chambers, so to speak, spiritual levels, that to go from level to level and from level to level, uh, one requires a sort of a password, so to speak, to get past the guard. The, the guards are, uh, are various angels. And so he describes the, um, the journeys that he went on and the passwords that he used, so to speak, and how he rose up from one level to the next. Um, now, when it says that there's, uh, in, 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 in the, <coughs> the text that you were looking at, it says seven chambers, that's really only the seven, the seven chambers of Yetzirah, but there are uh, many more. Um, okay. Um, I was afraid that you would close the session before I finish, but it's not making any sense on many aspects. I assume you're talking about the Akeda, true. It is something that we don't understand uh, easily, but uh, if you have more questions about it, you can always ask um, afterwards or um, privately if you want. All right. Uh, in other classes, you have mentioned Hitler, Shut, Tishtal, Shalut, etc. Can you speak about the meaning of these words? Yes. Okay. I can speak about the meaning of the words now. Um, there's the translation of the words, and then there's the whole concept behind the word, uh, behind the words. Let me just begin by saying that these are various modes of explanation, or rather various modes of focus, of various eras of Kabbalah. The earliest era of Kabbalah from, um, let me say era rather than era, as I say in America, because era sounds like E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, and I mean E-R-A, right? The, the earliest era of Kabbalah uh, was from really the time of, um, prior to the Zohar, but um, primarily the Zohar that explained it in much more detail than any other previous work. And there were other works before that. There was Sefer Yitzira, and there was uh, Sefer Habah here, um, and, and several others. But um, the Zohar was the one that started to explain the concept of the descent of the worlds. In other words, the descent of the, how did creation, a physical creation come about, a physical finite creation come about from the infiniteness from the infinity of the divine light, from the Orain Sof, as it's called. How did a finite world come into being from the infinite? So in order to explain that, it goes through the process of 
the stepping down or um, what would it be called? Um, uh, you know, when you, when you have, when you have a generator, uh, a very powerful generator, I don't know, it's generating a uh, thousand megawatts, right? You can't plug your toaster or your kettle into the thousand megawatt generator. If you did, you'll it'll completely explode. So what, the, what, what, what how, how does it work? What, what does the generator do? Or what do the elect, um, electrical engineers do? They take the power that's coming from the generator and they step it down via various, uh, via m m m numerous steps from the 1,000 megawatt generator, they go to various stations where there's, let's say, 100 uh, megawatts in each uh, of the 10 stations. Then they take from those 10 stations and divide it up further. Another 10 stations, now each one has uh, only um, uh, 10 megawatts, and so on and so forth, until it comes to your electrical box in your, um, um, at your house and then into the plug in your wall in which you plug your, uh, your toaster into the socket. Similarly, that's, that's called the process of hishtal shalut, the chaining down of the world. The shoshelet is a chain in Hebrew, and we're talking about the chaining down from infinity to finite, from infinite levels to finite levels. And that's basically the focus of Kabbalah from the time of the Zohar all the way through to the time of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, the Ramak. So he talks about, they all talk about all these works, well, most of these works, with, with the exception of uh, Abu Lafia and maybe one or two others, um, the Hechalot literature, with the exception of those, um, most of Kabbalah deals with that Hishtal Shalut, the chaining down of the world. That's called Hishtal Shalut. In the time of the Arizal, he changed the focus to a very large extent, and he spoke about not the chaining down, which is sort of a linear progression, but he talked about the concept of inter-inclusion, or rather, let's call it the concept of, um, I can't think of a word in English for it, but inter-effectiveness, or uh, symbiotic relationships, let's put it that way. He spoke about the, the concept of symbiotic relationships between class, between spherot and classes of spherot, between worlds and high worlds and lower worlds. That's called hit love shoot or hit love shoot, the the clothing of one thing in another. So just as you would clothe, for for example, if it's a very cold day, you would put your hand in a glove. Now the glove is um, um, if you go, if you're going to do uh, if you're a jeweler and you have to work on very fine uh, kinds of things, or even if you're a scribe and you have to write very fine letters, if you've got your hand in a glove, it's not going to work so well. Right? Things are just not going to work out all that well uh, because you're using a much rougher. So similarly, within the glove, there's the hand. And in a similar kind of sense, within lower worlds, you have higher worlds. Within lower spherot, you have higher spherot. And the inter-inclusion and interaction, the interaction, the symbiotic interaction of the of these spherot or classes of spherot, one with the other, is what Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the Arizal, focuses on. That's called hit, love, shoot. And that was the focus of much, most of Kabbalah from the time of the Arizal until the time of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov brought out a new uh, concept which was only very vaguely understood beforehand, and that's called Hashra'a. Hashra'a means the dwelling upon of holiness. So the Baal Shem Tov's teachings are teachings mostly to do with Hashra'a, or if you want to say it in the long terminology, Hashra'a of Elokut, the, the dwelling upon of godliness. In other words, how godliness, holiness, dwells upon and within, essentially, uh, the lower levels. Hashra'a. Hashra'a also means not only dwelling upon, it also means inspiration. So the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov are teachings that are meant to not inform, but to inspire. 
if you could put it this way, it's not information but transformation that the Baal Shem Tov comes to teach. That's the that's the um, uh, the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov and subsequent uh, disciples of his and their disciples and so on and so forth. Okay, so I hope that answers that question. Um, let's go now on the next one. Uh, Martin Mampurim, we are supposed to come the highest, the most important entity we would suggest humility. You know, this scenario is okay, and you give our genius also press. We would affect the world, and the world is more important than us. Um, <laughs> so just zero humility in other scenarios our agenda is totally suppressed when you say our agenda is totally suppressed meaning that the focus on us as individuals is not really there whereas the focus on uh, um, on Purim is La Yehudim the Yehudim, in other words, the uh, the Jewish people or whatever it is. I, I, I'm not sure that I agree with uh, with that entirely. Um, I don't know with a, with a, with the premise that um, uh, Akeda Yom Kippur, etc. Our agenda is totally suppressed. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm misunderstanding you. But yes, the focus is definitely different. The focus of Purim is really on the power of the individual to transform the world around him. Whereas the focus of Yom Kippur and various other holidays, uh, the, the uh, Yom Kippur is the, um, uh, the Day of Atonement, is the focus is on the nullification of the self. Uh, I, 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 I think that's probably what you mean. And yes, that's true. You can't have a focus always on nullification of self. You can't have a focus always on the power of the self. Um, I think there has to be, uh, you know, a reasonable um, amount of time given to both and to other things, if, uh, if the truth be told. But definitely, that is definitely true that the power of the individual to change, to uh, change darkness into light is what the festival the holiday of Purim really celebrates. celebrates. That's for sure. Um, a shorter answer, but I hope, um, I hope that... Uh, addresses it. If not, then write again in the chat box. Okay. Uh, comment on the end in the beginning from Sefer Yetzira. The end is wedged in the beginning. Um, in other words, basically what that means is that the ultimate purpose is wedged in the beginning. In other words, the beginning is not just a random beginning that happens by itself all of a sudden, but it is purposeful, it's teleolo teleological. The beginning is not just a, a happenstance. The beginning has a purpose, and the purpose is contained in the beginning. Um, uh, and that was, that's what it means, the end, the final purpose, the final way that things are going to be are contained in the... If you want, um, you can uh, just drop me a, an email, and I have a whole uh, long explanation. But it is in Hebrew. Um, of that concept. It's in Hebrew, I'm not sure that's... All right, well, if you want it, um, and you can figure it out, so you can go from there. And when there are two months of Adar, there's also from the end, is in the beginning. Yeah, I would have to see what Rabbi Ginsburg says over there. Um, it is a form of the end and the beginning because really the end of the year, uh, the, end, uh, the end of the month, is Adar, and the beginning of the new month is Nisan. The month that comes off, the month of Passover. So probably that's what he means, but I'm not sure you'd have to give me more of the quote to, for me to be able to comment on that. Okay, so another question. The animal divine souls will in one body. When that person or body reincarnates, let's say in the body of an animal, in this case, how would the divine soul benefit from that incarnation? It probably would not. Uh, when a human soul is reincarnated in an animal, that's actually a terrible uh, suffering for the soul. And you can understand that simply from uh, when, a purpose, when a person cannot find his purpose in the world, what he's here for, he suffers, he or she. 
they suffer when they can't find what am I doing here, what's my purpose, what's my direction. That can be suffering. You can imagine that suffering on a much greater level is experienced when um, when there is um, not even the possibility of expressing one's humanness. Now, it's a, a rare thing for a soul to be reincarnated, a human soul to be reincarnated in an animal, but um, it has happened. There's many stories of Al Shem Tov with a frog and various others. Um, and it's usually a result of some really, really bad uh, behavior um, in previous incarnation, in a previous incarnation. So, but let's not dwell on that kind of stuff because it's a little bit morbid. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it's not going to be a lot of benefit to us. We have to worry about what we're doing in this incarnation, not what happened previously or what may happen next time around. If we, if um, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, a, a quote from Frank Sinatra, I believe it is, um, who um, I don't know that he made anything more than um, than the simple, straightforward explanation, but it's useful nevertheless. And he said like this: that uh, you only need to do it once if you do it right. <laughs> I don't know. He wasn't talking about life in this world, I don't think. But um, um, whatever he was talking about, I think that's a useful way of thinking about it. You only need to do it once. You only need to be here this one life, this one time, if you do it right. Because afterwards, you've done your tikkun, you've done all your rectifications, you've done what you had to do, and uh, you can now move on to a higher state of being. What's my approach to the translation of Sefer Yetzira as compared to Arya Kaplan? Um, at this point in time, all my research is still in Hebrew. I haven't put it in English yet. Um, um, my approach is very different in the sense that Arya Kaplan um, uses the classical commentaries to explain the Sefer Yetzira. I use... Um, not the classical commentaries, but some things from the Rizal and most of it from the Baal Shem Tov and students of the Baal Shem Tov, in other words, from the teachings of Hasidut, of Hasidus. Uh, so it's a very different, you know, Hasidism like uh, illuminates the Sefi Yetzir in a way that I believe that no other um, commentaries do. And uh, they are scattered over a very vast literature, so it's you know it uh, takes a long time to dig them up and so on. But um, at the moment, it's in Hebrew, but it will be translated into English eventually. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's one of these things that just you know takes an inordinately long time to dig up all the information and then put it in the right order and and explain the information as it needs to be explained and so on. So. Um, the angel represents you, Kim. Judgment, said, uh, please not, Abraham. Um, yeah, yeah, that's why. Yeah, it's a little, and the answer is a little technical to the last uh, part of your question, Mark. So I don't think I'm going to answer it here. But you know, the different names of Havai and Elohim, but that's why. Havaya, later on, Yud Kei Vav Yud Hei Vav Hei, uh, was, the, um, was the attribute of compassion, of mercy, rather than Elohim, which is the attribute of Vura. So initially, the Akedah was um, given as a message to, to, to Abraham. The binding of Isaac was given as a message to Abraham as a concept in Gvura, in harshness. But Gvura also means, it can also mean to raise something up. Uh, in Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, uh, one of the verses says there, his left hand is under my head and his right arm, his left arm is under my head, his right arm embraces me. The left hand under my head, say the commentary is Rashi, to raise the head up. So Gvura is also a concept of raising up of of. Um, elevating oneself from being involved with the world. So initially, it looked like it was a concept of severity and harshness, but ultimately it was a concept of um, 
of being raised up to a higher level where then the whole concept of compassion or the transcendence of the name Yud Kevavke was possible. God said, please, Rashi explains that that means um, it was a test in a sense for God as well. Will you be able to pull this off? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that kind of the whole, uh, there are university courses. <laughs> there are university courses where they discuss the binding of Isaac as an entire course. That's what they do. The entire course is the binding of Isaac. It goes on for like four months, right? Three or four months. They do a course on the binding of Isaac and all the philosophy. So to, to deal with it comprehensively here is, uh, you know, it's not really possible. But there is a huge... Um, literature on it and many many things to discuss it's problematic on many levels but um, it's also very enlightening on many, many levels okay so uh, let's go a little bit further discuss the three approaches to Kabbalah the Zohar the Baal Shem Tov etc all right um, I thought I did that previously we spoke about Hishtal Shalut and Hitlab Shut and Hashra'ah. Please clarify the difference between the Zohar and the Kabbalah. Um, there really is no, uh, there's no, there's no, the Zohar is just one of the, uh, one of the f fundamental works of Kabbalah. Um, according to many, it's the fundamental work of Kabbalah because most of Kabbalah is based on the Zohar. Um, even the teachings of the Arizal and the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov as well pick up certain themes in the Zohar. Um, um, so that is the... So the Zohar is just one of, one of, the, one of the books in the literature of Kabbalah. Uh, recommend good reading material on the topic of Kabbalah in English. Um... Probably the best thing to do is actually to go on the website, Kabbalah. Uh, you, I mean, on my website, you have, you'll find some stuff, but I'm, uh, I don't post a lot. Um, so uh, the, probably the best place is kabbalahonline.org. There's many, many, many articles there. Any books by Arye Kaplan, A-R-Y-E-H, Kaplan with a K, Arya Kaplan. Uh, any books by Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg, G-I-N-S-B-U-R-G-H, Yitzhak Ginsburg. Um, books by myself. Uh, books by um, Rabbi Pinson, P-I-N-S-O-N. By Rabbi Vishnevsky, V-I-S-H-N-E-V. I think, S-K-Y or N-E-W-S, Um I don't know, I'm not sure if it's V or W, Vishnevsky, Moshe Vishnevsky. Those are all books in English which are worth reading. If there's any particular thing that you want to know about, just drop me a line and I'll let you know if, it's, uh, if I've heard of it or not. Um, okay. Yeah, so from Martin, yeah, that's correct. Cause and effect is Hishtal Shalut. And, um, and then cause and effect on a much deeper level, uh, layering would be Hitlab Shut. And the Baal Shem Tov would be omnipresence. That's correct. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, imminence, transcendence and imminence and so on. Yes. Um, okay. Keter protects Chochmah and Bina. What protects from what? Of course, it protects from what? Um, I would say that the word protects is not really um, a good translation. It says like this, that Seyag um, Shtika. Um, Shtika refers to Keter. Literally translated, it means a fence around wisdom or a barrier around wisdom is silence. In Kabbalistically, this says it refers to, it's referring to Keter, that Keter is a fence, so to speak, around 
um, is around Chochmah. What's it protecting from? It's not protecting in that sense. It's just, it means that it envelops it, uh, envelops it in the sense that it's on a higher level and generates a tremendous amount of energy for Chochmah. Keter generates energy for Chochmah. Chochmah is revealed wisdom. Keter is hidden wisdom. But from the hidden wisdom comes revealed wisdom. It generates and, and underpins the, um, the essence of Chochmah, of wisdom. So, I wouldn't say that protection is, uh, is the right word in this, uh, in this case. Uh, I start my book at the gate when when I publish more. Uh, you know, the truth is I would like to do a lot more writing. Um, problem is earning a living from writing. It's not so simple. Um, which, you know, you don't. You just don't earn a living from writing. It's, uh, it's just the way it is. I mean, you know, the, the, the audience for such things is not that great. And therefore, um, and especially now with, you know, everything, almost everything available free online, um, you know, publishing books is uh, an expensive um, undertaking. Besides being very time consuming, if you want to do it properly. I mean, I know people that can, you know, uh, knock off a book in uh, a couple of months, three months, but it's got about, uh, you know, that amount of thinking in it as well. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's... Um, it's a trade-off. Uh, you know, you want to produce stuff uh, quickly, <coughs> and the quality is definitely not um, worthy of the title, usually, in any event. Okay. Another question. Our class is clarify concepts, but don't necessarily speak of using Zohar for healing or doing one thing or another, like using uh, he, he wrote some for removing the negative, negatively, negativity, for example. Why? Um, I would say that the reason is that Kabbalah can tend to be treated as, um, you know, sort of a magic stone, if you know what I mean, um, you know, a magic amulet, and you use it for magical purposes and things like that. Generally, the truth is that, although there is that in Kabbalah, but but Kabbalah wants um, a different result, in my opinion. The result that Kabbalah is looking for is that the transformation comes from within you. How does that transformation come? By correct understanding of things, by correct um, devotion to the right things, by correct focus on certain modes of thinking, certain modes of believing, certain modes of behavior, certain modes of, modes of emotion, and so on and so forth. In other words, it's true that you can take this sort of, uh, you know, this magic, uh, uh, magic stone and apply it to a situation where it's going to cure the situation from outside, like, like as if you were taking a pill and it'll, you know, it'll cure the headache. But yes, it's true that that you know that 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 can work, and it's uh, it's definitely possible. But um, it's not the ideal way of approaching such things, in my opinion. Now, my opinion doesn't always count for that much, frankly. Um, you know, other people have different opinions, probably. But um, that's definitely the way I see it, and um, therefore I, you know, I do not emphasize the sort of um, magic is not a good word. I don't emphasize the um, what's a good word? What's a better word uh, than magic? I don't know. I don't emphasize the um, the uh, the transcendent healing properties of. Um, of Kabbalah to the extent that other people do. Uh, I believe that they're, they're very real, but again, this, it's better that it comes from within than applied as a sort of a bandage, if you know what I mean. Um, 
I hope that answers it. Uh, a friend who would tell us in his previous incarnation was an Indian dog. Uh huh. I would just shake my head. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what to say about that, but yes. Um, a good copy of the Safer Yitzira other than Aria Kaplan's, there isn't one. Um, I guess you're talking about, yeah. Uh, Daniel Matt and Gershon Sholem. I never liked uh, Gershon Sholem. I never liked Gershon Sholem. He has some very, very strange opinions about things uh, and a very dismissive attitude towards Kabbalah, even though he was... Um, I, I, let me just tell you a story about Gershon Sholem um, that will illustrate to you what kind of a person he was. I'm not saying anything that, you know, uh, disparaging. He, this was something that he himself responded and he said to somebody. He was giving a lecture and there happened to be uh, someone in the lecture was very curious about his private life. Like, uh, you know, he, when he gave lectures um, uh, in Kabbalah and he gave some very interesting lectures in Kabbalah, although I don't agree with his approach at all, uh, you know, his academic approach and his conclusions, I certainly don't agree with and I've argued about them and argued over them and showed how they're ac actually wrong, completely wrong. Um, if you want to look at the series of articles, you can see uh, the series of articles on Kabbalah online.org um, and look for authenticity of the Zohar or just look for my name, my name over there and you will see a series of five articles written many, many years ago, but um, five articles discussing the various academic approaches and showing why they're incorrect. In any event, so there was a story, there, a story there's, there's an, an event uh, that Gershon Sholm was speaking, was giving a lecture, a public lecture, and one of the, uh, for those who don't know, Gershon Sholem is a, one of the great academic, um, academics uh, 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 on Jewish mysticism. Very academic approach and, um, in my opinion, a very inconsistent approach because he doesn't take everything else into account. Um, because he narrowly adds, as academics do, their field is generally very narrow and they really don't know the broader field of things and therefore they make a lot of errors, in my opinion, but whatever. So he was giving a lecture on Kabbalah and there was a question and answer period afterwards and someone asked him, um, Dr. Shalom uh, or Professor Shalom, I, 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 you know, I see that you know a lot about Kabbalah, but you don't, you know, you don't live a religious life. Um, how come? <laughs> you know, he wasn't wearing a yarmulke. He wasn't uh, a keyboard. He, wa he wasn't. He wasn't religious in any way. He was uh, irreligious, or maybe even anti-religious. So I asked him, uh, you know, how come? So he said, uh, "Do you have to be a triangle to be a mathematician?" <laughs> that, was, that was his response. <laughs> Do you have to be a triangle to be a mathematician? In other words, you have to be a religious person to be an academic in Jewish uh, mysticism. You have to be, uh, you know, religiously observant. Uh, my opinion is yes, you do. Otherwise, you don't get the real secrets. Um, <clears throat> part of lifestyle, you know. Anyway. Um, why are the birds mentioned as messengers? Um, I'm not sure exactly what paragraph you're referring to, but in many, um, in many places, the birds are mentioned as messengers for those who can discern the speech of the birds or the twittering of the birds. You know, before Twitter, there, was <laughs> there were real birds, you know, and uh, there were those who could decipher what it is that the birds were saying. It says about King Solomon that he could understand the speech of birds and the speech of animals and so on and so forth. Certainly, this is true of the Baal Shem Tov as well. And the Arizal, it's called Sichat Ha'ofot, the conversation of the birds. So, um, uh, the Arizal says he could even understand the conversation of the trees. Now, whatever that means. Uh, do not Jewish people have a divine soul and animal soul? Every soul has a divine spark. And that is invested in a physical body which has its own independent life force. So 
um, everybody has a divine spark and everyone has an animal uh, aspect. Um, yeah, so, yeah, well, someone commented here that uh, Kamala is thought of by many as a magical pop science. Uh, right, and that's why many people want to stay, correct. Um, yeah, put him as we do it ourselves, right. Alchemy, exactly. Um, I think you would, yeah, right. Someone was, um, um, I, I'm not so familiar with, uh, I tell you the truth, I'm not so familiar with Rema Lightman. Um, I have seen some of the things that he's written, B'nai Baruch, and he seems to look, you know, I, I, I don't want to um, diss anybody. I do know that there are a lot of questions about Rema Lightman's approach. He bases himself on the Sulam. The Sulam is a commentary on the Zohar. And the Sulam himself was a, um, he was actually a, um, a Hasidic disciple. He was a disciple of a Hasid, the Parisova Rebbe. He was a disciple of the Parisova Rebbe. But he sort of struck, off his, uh, struck out on his own path to a certain extent. And uh, look, his translation of the Zohar into Hebrew is useful. Uh, some of his commentaries are useful, I quote from them, uh, but when it comes to Rabbi Lightman, uh, as with Rabbi Berg to a certain extent, and again, I'm not, you know, I'm not dissing um, anybody's, uh, you know, other approaches, but to a large extent, you can understand where they're coming from when you realize that they are very large commercial enterprises which means to a certain extent, and again, uh, you know, uh, it's up to everybody else to judge for themselves, but I think for me it seems that um, their approach to Kabbalah is one which will get the most bang for the buck, <laughs> if you know what I mean. You know, they're selling all kinds of formulas and incantations and courses and uh, and things like that, which and there's nothing wrong with doing it necessarily, but, uh, you know, I mean, uh, people need to get paid for their time. But, um, but when it becomes a commercial enterprise as such, um, you know, so let's leave it at that. <clears throat> okay. Um... Gershon Shalom was not an ignorant person. I mean, he had a lot of learning under his belt, and he'd gone through hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts and books and things like that. He, he was a very um, learned person, but he looked at everything. You know, there's, there's. Let me let me put let me put it to you this way. Uh, let me give you an analogy for Gershon Shalom, which you know, let's let's say that somebody is a music critic. Right, he's a music critic. He writes a column in I don't know the New York Times about music. Let's say a music critic is not necessarily a musician, and from that point of view, he's right. You know, uh, he he was a Kabbalistic critic. He was an, an an analyst, a professor of Kabbalah, but not a proponent of Kabbalah. Now, what a music critic sees on the surface of music is um, not necessarily all that there is to the music. A musician can sometimes appreciate um, great music to a much greater extent than the critic. The critic has to say something about the music, but what he sees very often is only the surface of the music. Uh, this person is a musician on themselves. But someone who plays the music for instance, there's certain, uh, now I'm not a musician, so I'm just, uh, you know, um, saying what, I, uh, what I've heard from others. There's certain uh, pieces of music, uh, um, symphonies, uh, Rachmaninov, various others, many others, I'm sure, that are extremely difficult to play. And only a very, very, very skilled musician can play. 
these pieces. But a critic like doesn't see that. All he hears is the music on the outside. He doesn't know the difficulty and the practice and the training and the expertise that goes into it. I'll give you another example. There was a man named, uh, a very famous violinist named Isaac Perlman or Yitzhak Perlman, um, who, I mean, he's one of the most famous violin players uh, in modern times. One of the most famous. I mean, he's, you know, um, top, 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 creme, creme de la creme, the cream of the cream, cream of the crop. So the story is told about him. He actually, um, he, as a young, as a young child, he had polio and like he would walk with braces on his legs, but his music, his musical, music skills are phenomenal. Uh, so the story goes that this actually happened, an event that happened once, uh, once upon a time. Um, he was the lead violinist in some Philharmonic Orchestra, um, and it was a world-class performance with you know, the best conductors in the world, and uh, who, I don't know who the conductor was, but it was a world, world-class event, and he was the lead violinist. And we were playing a violin, uh, uh, a piece that was written for violin by one of the great composers. And um, in the middle of playing, as he was just finishing a piece, or as he just finished a certain piece where, where the violin was uh, before the next piece started, his string snapped. One of the strings on his violin snapped. Now, for him to get up and go get another string and put it onto the violin or go get another violin, probably would have used the same violin, but put it in a different string. I mean, here was a man who was work, walking with, uh, you know, um, braces on his legs. It would take him 10, 15 minutes. They just didn't have the time. So everyone heard the ping of the string snap, and they saw everyone looked at him, oh, what's, oh, what's the conductor going to do? He's going to have to stop the performance until, uh, until Isaac Pullman gets a new string on his violin. He didn't. He just looked at the conductor and he said, carry on, you know, go. Um, and he reconstructed the music to be able to play it on only three strings. I think the violin has four strings, right? So he reconstructed the play on one less string. He reconstructed in his head as he was going along. That's the deal. Now, a critic, if he would have been looking from the outside and wouldn't have seen the string snap, would have, you know, been able to see, well, you know, that was Isaac Pullman playing, uh, you know, playing, I don't know, Brahms concert, whatever it was, on Brahms piano, whatever, Beethoven. But um, someone who was a musician would have understood the genius of such a person. How such a person would have been able to do such a thing, well, that demands not just musical understanding, but musical ability of a higher order. So Gershon Shalom was like a critic. He wasn't, he wasn't a Kabbalist. And therefore, there are a lot of things he didn't understand and a lot of things that he just dismissed and, uh, and so on. I hope that uh, sort of answered the question more. Uh... Okay. Uh, Martin Buber and his place in philosophy and Hasidism. Martin Buber was an interesting character. He was more of a philosopher, really, than, uh, but he was very much attracted to uh, Kabbalah and to mysticism. But... Um, I think he sort of tried to fit his understanding into, or tried to fit Kabbalah into his understanding of Jungian and and maybe uh, Freudian psychology. So, like, he puts a layer on Kabbalah, a layer of, um, of 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 thinking of terminology, where which doesn't really fit that well. Um, and uh, you know. Uh, I think it was well-meaning, but I don't think he quite got it. Um, also, he himself was also not a, maybe more towards the end of his life he was, but he wasn't an observant person. And, and, and again, it's, you know, it was more of a, uh, a writer about Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalah than a Kabbalist. Leighton is not a rabbi. Okay. Uh, Berg, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I... <sighs> 
I, I agree with you, Yael, and I agree with uh, I agree with Annie on these things. Lightman and Berg, you know, judge for yourself. I personally would not um, have anything to. In fact, I once went into with a uh, with a uh, with my son-in-law and a very couple of other people. I once went into uh, one of the um, um, Kabbalah centers, actually in Florida, funnily enough, because I just wanted to see what it was all about. We were surrounded <laughs> within about a minute and a half. We were surrounded by people. They wouldn't let us, you know. They were so suspicious of what we were doing there. They were nervous that we were going to, you know, whatever. We were going to look into their... Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't think that that would be... Um, you know, it was a public center. It wasn't like it was a private place and anyone could walk in there, but the only one certain people walk in there, not people who know more than they do. So <laughs> in any event, that was, uh, that was the Berg uh, Kabbalah Center. So, um, okay, uh, right. Yeah, it has to be brought into your life, not in uh, Kimberley. Yes, I agree 100%. If you don't bring it into your life, it's just theory. And then, then like, you're a mathematician, right? You're a, you're, a, you're a math critic rather than a, uh, you know, or a music critic rather than a musician. Um, as a student of my life for two years, I said to say, uh, that's not from paying money for books and never pay them one cent for their teachings, which are valuable, especially for beginners. Let's not throw the baby out for the bathwater. Okay. Again, Wendy, that's, you know, I, I don't, uh, that's why I was hesitant to criticize. There are people that have got things out of it. I mean, I'm not saying, but I do think that there's a point in time at which um, it's worth moving on, um, you know, and exploring the universe outside of the Kabbalah Center and so on. Um, okay, let's go further. And it works in professional sports as the best coaches may or not have been the best players. Uh, the best coaches may not have been the best club players, you're right, but at least the coaches have been players. They might not have been the best players, but they certainly were players. Whereas um, uh, someone who's not lived the life and see the difference that it makes in his life, I don't think can really appreciate the depth and the wisdom, etc., of uh, Kamala. Okay, but the analogy can't be taken too far either. <clears throat> Okay, isn't it true that each approach to Kamala and offers a different lens to look through and so to realize this allows us to save the baby and throw out the bathwater? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that that's true. Um, there is a work, a rabbinical work called Pirka Avot, or the Ethics of the Fathers, is sometimes called. Um, literally, it's uh, means the chapters of the fathers. It's a Mishnaic work. It's an ancient um, Hebrew work from about the uh, around uh, the second century or something like that, uh, the common era, and uh, first century, second century, and um, the. It says in, in two places there, it says, make for yourself or choose for yourself a teacher. So in other places it says, in Psalms, it says, I've learned something from all of my teachers, from all of my teachers. So we have to contrast these two things. If you can learn something from all of your teachers, why restrict yourself to one teacher and make yourself a rav, a teacher? And the answer that's given is that, yes, you can learn wisdom from everybody and from everything and from every situation and from many, many people, and you should learn different perspectives. But when it comes to arranging your life, you have to choose one path. You can't walk on all paths at the same time. Um, you have to make a choice. It would be like, uh, for example, um, you know, someone who is, uh, let's say, a doctor. Generally, unless he's a, you know, um, a general practitioner or whatever, if he specializes um, in something, he can't specialize in, 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 in too many different things all at the same time because, you know, it's just, it's just not possible. When it comes to living your life and arranging your life, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you have to choose a certain path. Some approaches are anathema, not anathema, but contrary to other approaches. So, for example, the approach of Hillel 
is different from the approach of Shammai, and you can't be both. You can either approach things in the way of Hillel or in the way of Shammai. You can't do both. Um, or at least at the same time. So when it comes to a path in, 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 uh, in, in life, again, one has to have one teacher uh, for that. Many people to learn from, one teacher to, as a guide. Now, again, it doesn't mean to say that other people can't be a guide. Uh, they can, but you have to make a, you have to make a choice uh, what, your, what your path is. Does it mean that you can't leave that path and go to another path? No, it doesn't mean that. But if you keep on chopping and changing, you're not going to get very far. That's what it means. Okay, let's go further. Oh, experience a part of our growth. When you have a purpose, let into all we meant to guide you place that creates purpose in our lives. Uh, okay, I think we answered that. Um, right. When well, answers are wonderful, we should teach more and more than more than one. I don't know where. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, time both mean zero uh, percent structure and one hundred percent structure. Tohu is 0% structure. Bohu doesn't mean 100% structure. Bohu is really two words. Bohu, that there is godliness therein, and therefore there is an inner structure, but not necessarily an outer structure. Uh, bohu is what is rectified by Tikkun, essentially. Uh, but that's a sort of esoteric subject that I'm going to go into right now. Um, single straight to our creator. Yes, I agree with that. Um, many cooks spoil the broth. That's the expression. Yeah. Or in this case, various teaching confuse the learner. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Last comment is going to go unanswered. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, the Again, the, uh, Wednesday's class is going to be on 